If you haven't done the QR code, please help us. Uh, give us feedback on this class and future CityU topics. Uh, we'll launch another semester of CityU at the end of October. Most of November, we'll do another four-week class. I said this a minute ago, I got a weird throat thing going on, so sorry you have to listen to me. Lindsay will do most of the talking. <clears throat> sorry about that. And then also, um, questions. We were going to cut it a little bit shorter tonight, do not, not as much uh, kind of teaching as we've done in the past. And so, um, I mean, we haven't even covered all of these things. Some of them we have, but any questions on any topic is free game or... Uh, even if it's not a question, we just want to, there's something that we haven't addressed yet. There's no way in four weeks we can cover every topic. And so maybe there's something you were really hoping that we would talk about. Well, this is your opportunity to ask questions. So those pieces of paper on uh, your table, because if not, we'll just, we'll just sit here awkwardly until somebody raises their hand and asks a question. I'll do it. Don't, 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 don't test me. I'll do it. Um, so just some ideas. <clears throat> what we're going to do tonight is cover a few just really practical things. And when I say practical, um, I would say these are what I would consider things that, that tend to uh, trip up couples the most. Uh, I sit down with a lot of couples that uh, deal and walk through these issues. And so um, there's only like five or six slides. There's not really a whole lot tonight. Then we'll take some time to debrief. And then you guys will have a little bit of time in your group as well uh, with kind of some ending questions that I, I just kind of wanted us to close out tonight on. Uh, just where we've been, obviously starting with just spiritual foundation, exploring the biblical foundations, that first week was so critical, God's beautiful design for marriage and what it meant, he meant it to be. And then the last few weeks doing spiritual, emotional, physical, um, the spiritual component of being um, connected spiritually, what does it look like for me to grow in my relationship with Christ, what does it look like for us to grow together, emotional connection, developing a, a genuine friendship. And how many times that gets lost along the way in a marriage? We just forget what it's like to be friends and enjoy each other and, and, uh, and re rediscovering that. What does it mean to be completely authentic and, and open, completely vulnerable? And then the physical aspect. We talked about sex last week. And uh, I, I did everything that I wanted to do last week except give you the homework that we had for you. Um, some people afterwards said, you really should have given us some homework. And I said, I should have, but I didn't. I missed that opportunity and I apologize. Um, we talked a little bit about attentional levels of relationships. We just briefly, briefly mentioned it last week, uh, but that is such a key component that people you surround yourself will determine the direction and quality of your life uh, as an individual, as a couple, uh, finding that. And then what we're gonna do tonight, just a few healthy practices, uh, a few things. We're not get, gonna get into the finances one because that honestly would be a whole session in and of itself. And so if you have a question on that specifically, ask it. Uh, but we're not gonna dive into that. Let's talk about a few things. Let's talk about conflict, uh, conflict and communication. <clears throat> uh, what I've learned over the years uh, is I kind of call this a dance. And the reason I call it a dance is maybe you're naturally a good dancer, uh, like my wife is. She really is. She can dance. When we he go can to too. He just doesn't no, do No, I'm not it. really that good. When we go to a wedding reception, though, like she's ready to go, and I'm like, I'll give you one song. I will give you, give you one song. I live right, right here. here. Yeah, yeah. We don't. And, and, and don't need no pizza. That's right. Anybody know that movie? Hitch, Hitch thank you. Okay, Classic. Um, that's where I live. Uh, but anytime you're dancing with someone, like when you're learning to dance with someone, it's always awkward at first because you're trying to figure each other out, right? And a lot of times conflict is like that. Uh, and the more that we practice healthy conflict and communication, the better we get at it. The problem is when you start practicing or you know, dis displaying unhealthy conflict and communication, how many know it, it never gets better? <laughs> so, so, so many couples get stuck in this cycle, this endless loop of bad conflict. Uh, so what we talk about as a dance, we think when you do these things the right way, what happens is over time, you should be better at conflict and co conflict should get shorter. You shouldn't be in conflict forever. What took you early on in your marriage, maybe you know, two or three hours or four hours or half a day for you guys to work through, now as you get better at conflict, we, we hope it doesn't take that. And if it does, or if it gets worse, a lot of times it's because there's a certain behavior that's, uh, that's dysfunctional, unhealthy, that's being reproduced over and over again. And if it goes on for too long, that becomes what's normal and you don't know any different. And so hopefully we can even maybe help you recognize some of those things. Some of you have done premarital counseling with me. You'll recognize this next part. Uh, we do this. 
What I do with every couple is I sit down and I, I make them tell me what is your conflict style and what is your partner's conflict style. It means what is your natural response when you get in conflict? Are you a like, I'm wanna, I wanna dive into it head first and I just bulldoze whoever's in front of me. I avoid it like the plague. I don't wanna talk about it at all. I shut down. You know, everybody's got their things. And, and usually some of it can be positive and some of it can be negative. You've gotta be, be able to identify what your conflict style is, what you need to be able to show up well. Because if you and your partner don't show up well in a space, how many know conflict is over before it began? Like you'll never get to resolution because you're not in a space to be able to work through it together. Uh, we learned several lessons. I know as, as, as newlyweds, I remember one thing that we had to work through is I'm sort of unemotional in conflict and my wife is a little bit more emotional. And every time she would get emotional, I'd be like, I can't talk to you if you're gonna do that. I, if you're gonna cry like that, I mean, why are you crying? Why, it's There's like, nothing to cry about, why are you crying? Right about. And I'm so like, I remember our mentors. Why, what are you sad about? I'm like, I'm not sad, I'm mad. I cry when I'm mad, I'm crying when I'm sad. I just not an emotional person. When I get really upset, I kind of talk the same as, as normal. And so. It's so annoying. <laughs> it's so. If you've ever been to like a sporting event other than OU football game with this guy, too, like our kids are like in a championship and he's like, calm, calm. And all the other parents are like, does he ever get emotional? I'm like, never. It's so annoying. Sorry. I'm telling them all to get a grip a on their life. <laughs> We had to work through that. We actually had, you know, like our mentor couple that did our premarital counseling kind of help us navigate that. We even went to, I remember seeing a counselor specifically about that, help me, how do I better like communicate with my wife that this is the problem we're having. Um, I know that it took us a little while to figure out, I, I'm a deal with it right there. I do not want to kick that can down the road and like it linger. Uh, my wife would usually need more, and still does, need some time to process it. So we've talked about this before. Uh, you don't leave the house ever without telling them where you're going and when you're coming back. Like you don't just leave like, maybe I'll return, maybe I won't. Uh, but she would always be like, hey, I need 10, 15 minutes. I know what she's gonna do. She's gonna drive to Sonic. She's gonna get a uh, diet Dr. Pepper and she's gonna process this and then come back and be in a space where we can actually deal with it in a healthy way. How many know that's really healthy behavior? Like that's me knowing what I need her knowing what she needs, and it's a compromise because we're not gonna wait four hours to talk about it, but we're also not gonna talk about it right there in that moment. Well, and I think like even with the emotion part, I had to really <laughs> understand for myself and help him understand when I, if I win or if I do get emotional, it's not because um, even like my emotions are actually that high, it's like the way I communicate. I, I'm communicating, I feel it deeply. It's not even that I'm like really that angry or you're sad or whatever it is. It's just like, I can't not do it sometimes um, because so, I feel something so deeply. So just knowing that about myself too, because it that was something, I mean, I, that was a revelation even for me, for me but knowing yeah. each other and that, He's not gonna do that. But because he doesn't do that does not mean he does not care. And that was, that was a big deal for me too. Yeah, I'm gonna go to this next one because it kind of defines these a little bit more. Um, so knowing your conflict style, your spouse's conflict style, how do you show up in a healthy way? You make compromises. Uh, if you're an avoider, how many know you cannot avoid it? You, you can't just be like, oh, we're not gonna deal with it and somehow it's gonna go away in days and then we forget about it. No, if that's not how things work, and you allow those things to build up and they just get worse and worse. And so you can't avoid it. Um, if you're someone who likes to attack and dig in immediately, how many know you need to know about yourself? I can't do that. I can't do that and move towards healthy conflict resolution. Uh, the next one is, do you have healthy rules of engagement? Uh, rules of engagement is how you win the battle before you get in the battle. Because when you're in the heat of a battle, guess what? You're like, oh, the gloves come off and whatever goes, goes. Well, you're never going to get to healthy conflict resolution then, ever. And so you need to come up with a list that's agreed upon between you and your spouse of things that you're gonna agree to do and not to do uh, in conflict. And so uh, we don't call each other names. We don't bring up the past as a way to use the past over each other. Like, well, you're just gonna do what you've always done, right? Um, <clears throat> we, don't, uh, we don't really yell. Um, we don't leave without telling each other where we're gonna go. We don't sleep in separate bedrooms. What else? That's what I was gonna say. Um... Everything's worth working out before going to sleep. And that doesn't, and working it out doesn't mean it's solved. <coughs> working it out means you're at a place where you can tolerate <laughs> um, your presence. 
if you will. And if you're not at that place, then you know that's a bigger, that's a, maybe a bigger thing. But. Yeah, and I think you've got to be honest. Whatever those rules like for you, what makes you shut down in conflict? One of my spouse does does this immediately. I shut down. Well, they. He came from a family that they just yell. That's just what they did. And every time he yells, you shut down because you didn't grow up in that. And, and you, I mean, you've got a fear of somebody like authoritative figure yelling at you. Well, you're never going to be able to work through conflict. You've got, you've got to figure out what that looks like um, to, in a healthy way. And, and come up with those before you get into conflict. If you don't follow them, guess what you do? You stop, you apologize, you pick up where you left off, and you keep moving forward. And again, this is, this is both sides of the coin. It's, it takes both, just like we talked about in, like I feel like, every session, it takes both parties being willing to not only come up with the rules of engagement, but to also follow them and honor them. Um, because it just takes one of you not doing that to kind of break the whole thing down. So it really is a mutual respect that you've got to have and there. I, I think this takes a ton of self-awareness. Um, maybe all you saw is how your parents handled conflict. And maybe it was dysfunctional. And like, you don't even know it's dysfunctional. You just thought that's how normal people did things, but it's not. Or, or you're kind of stuck in this cycle. It's a self-awareness to know like, this is what I resort to. Or I want to win, I want to win the argument so bad that I'm willing to say anything or do anything to my spouse. Well, guess what? If one of you wins and one of you loses in, in an argument, you both lose. Welcome to marriage. Right? I mean, there, there can't be a win-lose in marriage. It's gotta be win-win. You're thinking, how do I move this? So I always think of conflict. If there's a ball, you wanna move that ball forward toward con con uh, healthy conflict uh, resolution. Every time you bring up the past in a bad way, every time you call them a name, every time you make a you statement, every t you're moving the ball backwards. You're gonna make it twice as hard for you to get towards the end every time you do one of those things. And let me tell you, I've done this long enough to know that most couples have those things. I, I know what to say. I know how to push your button, and so I'm gonna do that in this argument because I wanna try to get the upper hand, right? That doesn't work, that doesn't work. You're gonna be in conflict forever. There's gonna be bitterness, resentment. It's gonna be almost impossible to get towards health, like health at the end of it and kind of breaking that. And then I put, if we go back uh, one real quick, um, practicing honor and humility the fruit of the spirit. I, I don't know how you do it without that, right? It's a mentality of we're on the same team even in conflict and I'm not trying to beat you uh, or you, know, you don't have to defend yourself because we're working towards the same goal. We're, we're figuring this out together, right? So honor, uh, honor is a, is a matter of the heart. Like I would never um, use her insecurity and something she did in the past to hold that over her, right, in, in the present to try to win a battle when I know that's something, like we know everything. Like she knows what to say if she wants to wound me, but that's, that's not what I'm called to, right? I'm called to protect her and honor her and taking that into conflict. And why do I say that? It's because conflict really is the place where the gloves come off. Well, and, and I think it's so important to have that plan now when you're not in conflict because just like in the heat of the moment when the gloves come off, we A, either go for the jugular, or B, we revert to what we know or what we've seen happen. So you really have to have a plan, in, like an actual plan in place for when those moments come. Yeah. Uh, I talk to couples all the time. I ask them about their parents' marriage. I already talked about that. And it's amazing how when it comes to conflict, very few people ever, ever saw that modeled well or modeled in front of them. Well, my parents never talked about anything difficult in front of us or my parents just yelled at each other and we just heard them in the back room and then my mom would leave and my dad would come out and say something and she would never come back for hours and then I just didn't know what happened after that. We just, eventually everything returned to normal. You know, like that's not healthy. Like you have to break that pattern in your life. That's like a generational thing that you're like, for our family, for our marriage, for our kids, we're breaking that. We're gonna do conflict the right way. Let's keep going. Yep, one more. Um, so just kind of wrapping up a really co quick conversation on this, but um, identifying is there a cycle or pattern of unhealthy be behavior that you seem to repeat? Maybe you're stuck on something and you can't see it any longer. You need somebody else to help you see it. You know how often I sit down with a couple and they just tell me their story and they're like, we've been doing this for four or five years. And I'm like, yep, you're stuck in this loop. 
and the loop isn't normal. No. Nope. It feels normal because you've been in it so long. But and it's, it's not. honestly not even that hard always to break out once you realize what it is and you're willing to do something about it, right? So identifying it. Keeping the ball moving forward. Avoid any language or behavior that moves the ball backwards. Avoiding you statements. Like you're thinking about what's coming out of my mouth. Is what's coming out of my mouth setting a, a, a place for us to move forward? Or is it setting a place where we're moving backwards or getting defensive? Will you always do this? This is what you do. What, if, what are you gonna do if somebody says that to you? Man, I'm putting my, sh my shield up because somebody's coming after me. What if I instead be like, I, I wanna break this, I wanna do this better, and I, we always seem to be in this place. How, how do we move forward out of this? Like that's, that's language that's like, I wanna invite you into this because it's a problem and it's both of our problems, right? I mean, there's just, it's either an invitation or if it's like, nope, you're gonna defend yourself. And so keep the ball moving forward. Uh, learn when it's okay to move on from conflict. So I, I actually, this comes up a lot. Some people think that they have to come to complete agreement on everything. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> Sometimes you agree to disagree. Sometimes you've talked about it and now it's out there, you've dealt with it and you have to actually move on. And don't beat the dead horse. Right. I'm like, don't just keep talking about it to talk about it. Like if you have kind of come to a, like, I mean, maybe you're not in total agreement, but we can agree to disagree. And we know this is probably not something that we need to talk about regularly because all it does is like, you know, yep. that's okay. If you can't Depending move on, on from it, it is, I guess. Yeah, if you can't move on from it, then you identify that we need more help from probably somebody else. We need someone else to talk to to help us move out of this because we're not able to come to an agreement in this area. Well, this or is, it may be big enough where you, you do, it, it, you can't just move on. Right. Well, this is something we talk about with, premarital counseling a lot too, is like not every hill is worth dying on. Some hills are worth fighting for and dying on, but most are not. So I think you have to really be able to ask yourself, is this something that is worth dying for? And most of the time it's not. If it is and you can't come to that place, that's where you're like, okay, red flag, we need, to, we need help, we need somebody outside of us to figure this out. But most of the time, the things that we get in conflict about are not worth yeah. dying on that hill. Oh, I'm sure we could have some testimonies right now from people in the room of this, <laughs> but you know, a lesson you have to learn early in marriage, if you're gonna enjoy marriage, is discernment on when do I say something and when do I not, mm -hmm. right? You can't avoid things and just sweep it under the rug, but you can't die on every hill. Mm -hmm. You just can't, you have to choose your battles, don't you? Mm -hmm. You have to have discernment to say, okay, this is something that it needs to be talked about because if not, it's gonna grow mm -hmm. and it's gonna turn into something else. Or it's, you know what? Um, it's not really that big a deal. It's more something internal for me that I need to deal with and I'm gonna move on from it because it's not worth having a conflict. That's just wisdom right there. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's inviting joy yeah. <laughs> into your marriage. And there marriage. is balance in that, in, in both, in having both. The non avoid and I think, again, it's self-awareness of knowing yourself. Am I an avoider? So I'm like, oh, this isn't the, deal, the hill worth dying on. Or am I the, let's fight every battle. You do have to know yourself and find a balance in both of those things. Um, healthy boundaries. Anybody read the book, Boundaries? Great book. You know what I was really shocked with as a pastor? That is probably the number one thing I end up counseling people about. I would have never guessed that like 18 years ago when I started this, but it comes up over and over again, not just in marriages, but in life. And so um, this is what happens whenever you're in charge of the graphics for your own class. <laughs> this is what you get right here, all right? Better than me. <laughs> yeah, don't email me, you okay? This is, this is, I drew that, okay? Um, the gist of, of boundaries is this. You are the gatekeeper. Yep, that's a gate right there. It opens, okay? I couldn't get rid of that other white line, so just imagine that it's open. It's not my gifting. Uh, you're the gatekeeper of your lives and you determine the level of access and influence someone has in your life. So if somebody who is unhealthy in your life has full access, closest proximity is in your inner circle and you're wondering why your life is a mess, guess what, it's not their fault, it's your fault. Come on now, we could just pray right now and end. Yeah. That's good. If someone is negatively affecting your life or leading you away from Christ, your spouse, you need a boundary. Boundaries can be the most loving thing that you can do for others and it can be one of the most loving things you do for your spouse and yourself in order to be healthy, right? And so it is learning as the gatekeeper, 
what level of access do you give people to your life? The people who are inside there who have closest access to you, if they are not leading you closer to one another and to your spouse and closer to, to Jesus, guess what? You need a boundary. If you are around people who are influencing you in a negative way, I don't care if they're your best friend, your mom, your dad, your brother or sister. Um, I, I, there's like a, a proverb that talks about the shrapnel of fools will, will hit you and that's exactly what will happen. You will be affected by the shrapnel of someone else's dysfunction. So we, if we are gonna be healthy as followers of Jesus, now first and foremost, you have to have self-awareness to know like, are we actually healthy? Because everybody thinks that they're always you know, the healthy person and someone else is always a dysfunctional person. Um, but if that is the case, what does this look like? What does this look like to have boundaries? Sometimes uh, you can have the strongest boundaries in the world and people won't honor them, they won't follow them. And sometimes you have to remove a person from your life really hard. Unhealthy people, let me say this, will not appreciate boundaries and often they will push back against it. Uh, we have had to practice this with family and friends and all kinds of people in our life. Um, I, I deal with like newlywed couples all the time who are like, they've got a best friend and they hang out two or three times a week and then they get married and that best friend is like, but we're still gonna hang out two or three times a week because we're best friends. And I'm like, well, you're gonna have to need to have that talk real soon, right? Because it's not normal for you to be hanging out like three or four nights a week with somebody who's not your spouse. Like that's, that's weird, right? Maybe it's a mom a mom who means really well, but a mom who wants a key to your house when you're at work can come in and do your laundry for you because she loves you and you're her little baby and you'll always be her little baby even though you just married somebody else, right? <laughs> right? I mean, that, I did not have that. No, mother. we didn't have that. That, that no. made it sound like I don't know, no. did not have that. But it does come up, right? We always say this, especially with, with family relationships. If, if the issue was like with Lindsay fam if Lindsay's family, she would be the spokesman for us right? For, for family. us. For not us. for me. Not it's, for Matt. Matt, it's not, hey, Matt didn't want to come tonight. Uh -uh. I don't throw him under the bus. She wouldn't throw me under the bus like that. Yeah. If it was my family, I would be the spokesman for us. But let me tell you what's most important, that we are a team. We make decisions for us, right? We speak on behalf of both of us. Uh, we don't let somebody intentionally or unintentionally divide us. And let me tell you, they will. They don't even know what they're doing but they're like, oh, my baby would never do that. That's gotta be that spouse of his, right? She planted that thought inside of his head um, because you know, my baby boy would never, never, never think like that. You know? Well, and I would say in your own conflict with one another, being very selective and using wisdom on who you share that conflict with. Family, no matter if your mom, dad, whoever is your very best friend, it's really, really hard for them to be objective in certain circumstances and situations when it involves their own kid or their own, you know, family member. And so having people, since we're on the family situation, having people out maybe outside your family who can be an unbiased third party is best because even though, like I said, maybe they're your best friend and you think they love Matt just as they love me. No, they don't. They, they, they want to, and maybe it seems like they do, but there, there's a, I mean, you have your own kids, some of you, you know, and you get that. Um, there's going to be a part of that. So I would be careful what the level of access you give them to your conflict, because even when you've moved on from a conflict, sometimes mom did not forget about it and mom's gonna hold on to it, you know? Um, so just yeah. a little. You have to practice boundaries in your family, your friendships. I have to practice boundaries with people in the church, yeah. right? I mean, it's a natural part of coworkers and you know, people who will, it, it's about learning to like, if we're gonna be healthy, we have to protect this. Mm -hmm. We have to protect this because nobody else is gonna try to protect it if we don't. They'll, they'll unintentionally or intentionally, <laughs> right? Yeah. Do, do all kinds of things uh, that are unhealthy. Well, and we have to be careful not to let other people's conflict get us in conflict. We deal with so much, you guys. I mean, with, even within our families, within the church, we deal with people's conflict a lot. And we'll get into conversations about somebody else's stuff, and we may not disagree. I mean, we may not agree on it. And so then, then we're fighting about somebody else's fight. 
And yeah. I'm like, whoa, whoa, we did this a lot even in I our family. I would say we were way better at this now, but we didn't do we it We weren't always. Early in ministry, we're like, yeah. why are we, why are we so worked up about something that it doesn't even apply to us, you know? Uh, like pump the brakes, we have to have a boundary, like maybe we can talk about it and we go, okay, I don't really agree with where you are on that and that's okay. Like we need to move on because we're not gonna allow someone else's conflict to become ours. Yep. Uh, I mean, just another example real quick would be, I have people that come in and you know they've got a good friend group that they grew up with and they're around, but you go and spend time with that friend group or you go on a little retreat or getaway and you come back and you're not a better person, right? And your spouse can see it, but you can't see it. Oh, it's just the boys. Man, I grew up with the boys. You know, it's like, nope, you, you need a boundary with the boys because the boys aren't honoring their spouse and loving Jesus. And you're not a better husband and father and man of God when you're with them. And I mean, that's part of maturing and growing up is realizing that and saying, yeah, my first responsibility is to God and to this other person. You know, and it doesn't just be, be the boys, it could be the girls, whatever you wanna call it, right? Um, boundaries, it's part of it. So you and your spouse must be in agreement on what boundaries need to be established. Sometimes that's really hard. That's why a lot of times people call their pastor or a friend or, hey, help me, I don't even know what boundaries look like here. And I'll be like, well, this is, this is what it means for you to be in relationship with this family member because I know their family and you love them, but their life's a wreck. So if you're gonna be in their life, you're gonna have to have some really strong boundaries. And they may not even like those boundaries, but it's the only way for that relationship. And the boundary may not be cutting them off. It very well might be eventually that, but the boundary isn't always like, I can't have a relationship with you. I can't go hang out with the guys at all. Uh, but it's using wisdom in that. Maybe the weekend trip is not a great idea, but having dinner, I mean, knowing where that's using wisdom and a lot of times counsel outside of where you are to know what that wisdom is, what the boundary is. Uh, marriage expectations. I give this spiel uh, every premarital counseling couple and most postmarital counseling couples. It's kind of my thing. Uh, there's a long thing I write up about it, but I'm not gonna give you all of that. Uh, around 45 to 50% of marriages end in divorce. Uh, us in the church, we're slightly better than that. So come on now, give yourself a hand. Very slightly. Uh, we're like 32 to uh, uh, 40% or something like that. Um, those numbers kind of shift, but generally speaking, most statistics will show you 45 to 50% of marriages end in divorce. There's lots of stats as well that say of those marriages that do survive, a high percentage of those couples report being unsatisfied in their marriage. Nobody sets out for divorce. Nobody sets out to be unsatisfied. Nobody sits there as newlyweds. I've never met the newlywed couple that are like, man, we really hope to be really good roommates here in about 15 years, you know? Um, and yet the reality of where so many people find themselves, right? Now, there can be a lot of reasons why, but I do think one thing in, in, in a healthy marriage that we do is that we reset expectations, right? You've dropped the ball, we pick it back up and we set the bar high. I think we have to set the bar high. I said, if we, if we don't set the bar high, then what we get are just mediocrity. <laughs> we're just settling. We're like, well, I hope, I hope to get by. Well, if we're the 50% that don't get divorced, that's a win. No, how many know I want better for you than that, right? Uh, I want you to thrive. And so a couple things here that I think help us set the bar high. What does that look like? And maybe the bar's not high right now. And maybe the greatest thing you could do from this intentional marriage class for four weeks is just have a 10, 15 minute conversation on the drive home or when you get home and say, hey, what do you think it looks like for us to reestablish a, a high bar of expectation? What are some things that we've dropped? We can't do everything but what can we do right now? What are the one, two, three things? What are the, the simple but, um, but necessary like next steps that lead to transformation? So number one is just identifying what's currently broken. Like this is broken. It's the humility and the, you know, really the audacity and the courage to say, I, I recognize this is broken. And then how will we go about getting it fixed? Is there a ball that we've dropped that we need to pick up again? That can be dating, it can be your sexual relationship, it can be uh, friendship, right? It can be growing spiritually, it can be your personal commitment to following Jesus, it can be putting the, the right people uh, in, your, in your life. You just, you just dropped that ball, you got lazy with it, you never picked it back up, right? What are some things we need to do to reestablish high expectations in our marriage? 
our, our standard, especially as followers of Jesus, this beautiful picture we painted in week one of marriage um, is something worth fighting for, right? It's worth giving everything to. And so how do, we, how do we raise that standard back up to that level of what God designed marriage to be? Uh, what does it look like for us to intentionally pursue a healthy marriage and not just wait for problems to move us to change? So many times in our lives, we know this, right? It's, it's uh, struggle, it's suffering, it's difficulty that finally moves us to do something. What if we didn't just wait for that? What, what if we were, had enough wisdom to say, um, and I think that's gonna happen naturally, <laughs> that's gonna happen, but what if, what if we were proactive? What if we didn't just wait, but we had a, a plan to like grow and continue to move the ball forward? And let me tell you, when you're around the right people, that happens naturally. Uh, we spent the last two and a half days at Shangri-La up on Grand Lake with six other pastor couples. Guess what? We set that retreat up. We pursued them. Nobody asked us to do anything, guys. We asked them to do everything. And we took them out to Shangri-La. We got there Sunday night and uh, we had no agenda but just hanging out. And we had a great time. And guess what? When you're other, other pastors and spouses, you just naturally connect. You talk about life and faith and struggles and all the things in between. And you go golf together. And then when you're golfing together, somebody shares their deepest insecurities because you're on hole 15 and you've got six old dudes in front of you and you know you're not going to hit for another hour. And you just start talking about it, right? And you surround yourself with the right people. Look what happens, right? It just, things begin to, good things begin to naturally occur because you're with the right people. You know, and so I think that's a, that's, that's a beautiful thing that we can focus in on when you feel isolated alone, man, begin to put yourself in the right, right spots. So um, questions, topics, then what you're going to do is you're going to go back and you're going to have this conversation around the table about marriage expectations. You can share at whatever level you feel comfortable sharing. Uh, as always, you're all picking the same table, so you should know everything about each other already. Um, nobody picks a new table every week. It gets a new, new people, so... Um, thank you, whoever submitted a question, so I would at least have one. Yeah. No, it's not anonymous. It's from... How do each of you prioritize time for yourself outside of work, family, couple time? What has worked best for you? Oh, my gosh. What a great question to ask us, because we were so bad at this. So bad. So horrible. So bad. Let's I come you... by it naturally, because I have no hobbies. <clears throat> yeah, my Never wife has have... no hobbies. He has all the hobbies I love that everything. take like four and five hours. Yeah. Um, so he never felt like he could do any of the things he loved because he felt like I had to also have the same kind of hobbies that took four and five hours and it would be like equal. And so you're never going to do anything because I'm never going to do anything. And we never did anything. We got better. It was a ball we dropped a lot. Well, I don't even know if it's a ball we dropped other than it was, we are both wired to like, I'm not going to do anything because I don't want to leave you a home with the kids. And I know that's going to be hard for you. So I'm just going to suck it up and I'll be a martyr for this. We're both that way. And she would do the same thing. And so how many know that's not healthy for either of you? We were both miserable. <laughs> yeah. We worked this out with our, with our therapist at, at times to just to talk about, no, it's, it's healthy for you to have things. What's the other ditch on the other side? is that you're leaving your spouse all the time because you have a hobby that you love to do like all the time and you're doing it three or four or five nights a week and you don't even talk or ask them about it. That's really weird too. Um, what's not weird are leaning into a few things that you love to do and things that rejuvenate you. And I would even say they're Sabbath rhythms. A Sabbath rhythm for me fills my cup. Um, I love playing golf, but I stopped playing golf when our kids were born because I didn't need a four and a half hour pastime. Right. And so like even the last few years, like, you know, one of the Christmas presents for me is I got called, like custom golf clubs like two years ago. And so her was like, you need to play golf like once or twice a month because you love it. And I do love it. And honestly, what it does for me, it just allows me to be outside and decompress. Mm -hmm. And so I have a wife who is gracious enough to be like, you love doing that. You need to pick that back up in your life. Well, and I see the benefit from it. You know, I see the benefit of like, hey, if you are able to go golf and have fun, like you're a better person because of that. And, and same with him. He sees the benefit of me going and hanging out with some friends and having dinner and not coming home until well after the kids are in bed because, yeah. you know, especially when they're really little. Um, 
I was a better person because of that. So it was like, yes, please go do this. And for her, I was like, it's time to get a hobby. You have to get a hobby. I can't be the only one with a hobby. So you like, you start playing tennis. Uh, now we play tennis together. We play tennis out at Shangri-La this week together. So some, some things that we do together, some things that we do separately, but having a good balance, you talk about what that healthy balance looks like. It's really good. And again, a, a good Sabbath rhythm are things like it fills your cup emotionally, physically, right? When you, when you get done doing that, like you, you feel rejuvenated, even if you're physically exhausted, right? But you're rejuvenated because it's good for you. I think that's a great, great rhythm we didn't always get right. We had to work a little harder at that one. Yeah. Don't, don't be a martyr. Just don't. Like, it, it's not worth it. You're not gaining anybody's respect or gold stars or anything like that. So don't, don't be the martyr. Yeah, I think what happens when you have that mentality, I know for me, is I would, I, it, what it turns into is actually bitterness. Sure. You become bitter. Because you think like, well, look what I'm doing, or look, you know, look, I'm always doing this, or I'm always here. And there were times where like, well, I can't leave because I need to be here. We also had four kids under the age of five, so I understood every time that I left and did something, I was leaving her with four children under the age of five. Um, I don't recommend everybody do that. Okay, <laughs> have four kids under the age of five, um, but we did, and so you know, we had to deal with some of those things that come along with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a season. Everything's a season. Ooh, we got hands and cards. Oh, come what? on now. I'll go get them. Lindsay will bring them up and read them. Anybody else cards to pick up? Yep. Cards, cards. We got cards. We weren't able to obviously address everything, so there's a lot of topics that got left on the table. This is actually a little bit scary, you guys. Like, we have no idea Thanks. what's on these cards. They have not been vetted. That's terrifying a little bit. Did you have, ever have different opinions of parenting styles and how did you approach these together? Um, absolutely. I mean, there's so many approaches to parenting. Now, thankfully, I, I think a lot of the major ones for us, we were aligned on. Uh, if you're not aligned on those, it's gonna take more work to work through those. But I mean, how, how to discipline your kids, how many know that's really complex? And like, you may not always see eye to eye. And I think even today, we're trying to figure out like, how do we discipline our kids towards the gospel? If you were at family camp, we talked about this recently. Like, how do we shape their heart towards that? And I mean, that's one that <clears throat> we talk to parents and there's not mutual always agreement on. And it is, you're a team. You have to figure that out. What does this look like? What's compromise look like? I was gonna say the, that key word is compromise on all of it because neither one of you, whether, sorry to burst your bubble, but neither one of you are perfect and have it figured out and completely right. So probably right for your family because no one's right or wrong on parenting, good grief, it's so hard. No one's probably right or right, right or wrong. There's probably some kind of middle ground that's gonna be best for your family. And not to over-spiritualize this, but I'm telling you, if you will take your spouse and you guys will pray specifically about your child and your prayer is this, Holy Spirit, show us how to best parent this child, right? Not because I read this book or not because I grew up doing this, but what does this child need? Like we parent all four of our kids a little bit different. There's some values that are all the same, but all different because how many know each of them are very unique and they need different things. And the Holy Spirit, I really do, I, I, I believe that he leads us when we need it. Um, for all that. What are examples of healthy conflict in front of children? Um, I, I, I don't know. This is my opinion on the matter. You can chime in on this. I think if we always try to shield our, our kids from any kind of conflict, they never grow up seeing healthy conflict resolution. They're like, well, I guess my parents didn't fight, but they know we probably did. They just never got to see it. Now, I think if there's a level that you don't show your kids, you know, if there's if it, a level of intensity that breeds fear or, you know, all those things like, but we, you know, get frustrated in front of people and they see that we don't resort to name calling or things like that. And we, you know, we work through it and come to an agreement. I think that's healthy. And I mean, there are times where our kids would be like, oh, mom and dad, you know, they're, they're like, they're waiting for something. Well, they're not waiting because we're not gonna start yelling at each other, but they can tell like, oh, this is a moment. What are they gonna do? Right? I think that's important. They see it's that. It's important and it's a really healthy, it's, I think it's really healthy because again, they do get to see how healthy conflict works, but there's also security in knowing my parents don't always agree on everything and they're still going to be able to figure it out at the end of the day and we're going to be okay. There's not this fear of like, oh my gosh, there's yelling. And because 
sad to say, our, our kids grow up in this world of divorce too. And all their, not all, but a lot of their friends are probably have experienced it or are going to experience divorce in their family. So seeing your, their parents have conflict, work it out, and that you can do that, and that exiting is not always the answer, that's a huge deal. That's a huge um, security. I, I don't know how, to, how else to say it. It's a, it's you a answer this one. Security. Uh, do you have a written family mission statement? And if so, what point in your marriage did you create that? Oh, yeah. Um, we did uh, do a family mission statement when our kids were really little, actually. Um, and my recommendation for that is to keep it really simple. Uh, some people love to write beautiful, long things. Um, I wanted something that our kids could remember and that we could remember and that kind of encompassed a lot of different things instead of like specifics. Um, but yeah, um, ours was love God, love each other, choose what's right. And I have a video of Sophie going, yeah, God, yeah, da, chew, what, what. <laughs> I'm like, so they learned it really. I remember, well. I mean, they would, scripture, memory verse, that, we would do that in the car, but especially like the bathtub at night, like when the kids were in the bathtub, Lindsay would have them repeat that. We had a marriage mission statement first, then we developed a family mission statement, um, having them repeat that. We would have conversations, I mean, this may sound weird to you, but even when our kids were little and they would be in the bathtub and we'd be washing them, we would actually tell them like, hey, we want to remind you, like, who are the only people that can touch you in these places? Mom and dad and Dr. Daly. Nobody else does, and if anybody else ever does, like you tell us, right? We, and mom and dad are around when Dr. Daly's around. Yeah. We would have conversations like that, and we would just, I mean, about life, about things that our kids needed to know. Uh, I feel like the bathtub was kind of those moments where we would have when they were really little. They were really little so. Not anymore. <laughs> Boundaries. Boundaries. You get real awkward real fast. <laughs> The joke I want to make now is how do we get our 13-year-old to put on clothes when he's in the room? We're like, dude, wear something. Come on. Too old for that, Yeah, bro. you're too old for that. What are some tips or ideas for someone with chronic health issues and pain that makes sex and physical intimacy very, very hard? Um, what a great question. Mm -hmm. What a difficult situation uh, to find yourself in. Um, I think that can go with... Well, is there another one similar? Like there's another one that was kind of similar. Yeah, I think this is... I'm not going to have like the perfect answer for you because I think this is an ongoing conversation, but reminding yourself that even before the sexual intimacy, that, um, that emotional connection and intimacy is being able to openly share with each other, both the good and the bad and how you feel and not letting resentment and things build up to be able to have this open communication to say, hey, I want to be sexually intimate, but I want you to know it's difficult for me or I don't always feel that way because of my health. And for the other person to say, hey, because of your health, sometimes I feel forgotten or neglected or uh, there's things like that. You don't address those things and say them openly to each other in a safe place. How many know that's where it can really build and it can come out in other ways later? And if you need to do that in front of a mediator or a counselor or a therapist, do that. If you, if you can't do that with each other, you've got to get it out there in a way that said, this is the reality of the difficult situation that we find ourselves in. Now, how do we figure out a solution moving forward where it's not bitterness and resentment that grows, but we're on the same team and we're going to overcome this together, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I think the worst thing that can happen is it's unaddressed. And I'm, I'm just telling you, you guys know this, but when bitterness grabs a hold in our heart, how many, everything is severed, friendship, relationship, intimacy. It, it now just feels like me against you. My heart kind of closes off and that's the enemy's, that's, that's the enemy's goal, right? That's where the enemy gets a foothold. Well, I think it's also figuring out, you know, <clears throat> with health things, especially like if, if sex is painful and things like that, that is not something you want to let just go on and on and on. And just like, well, that's just the way it is. That's just my lot in life. Maybe, but maybe there's things we can be proactive about. And what are some other creative ways that we can still be intimate with one another? And this is kind of going, I think, with this one. This one was, you know, during yeah. pregnancy, symptoms and all. Let me finish reading. You took it from me. Yeah, I, I think having an open conversation. <laughs> what else is what else it's is having open it? conversation about that. And I, I I'm really grateful because in this situation, and I know this isn't always the case, is like Lindsay was very, very aware of that. She she understood like, okay, I, I'm not going to initiate as often or feel that way. And so 
Um, how can I serve you? And you need to be able to tell me. And when I forget, you know, bring it up, things like that. And then we creatively would, would work towards that together, whether you plan it or whether you just have an open conversation. What you can't do is just cut it off, right? That, that and, and just say, well, I'm, the, the, I'll read the rest of it. During pregnancy, symptoms and all, what are some things a couple can do to be intentional about physical intimacy? And this, I think, goes along with the health thing, too. It's not just, you know, I, I have health problems or, se- you know, sex is uncomfortable for me or whatever. It's like, okay, how can we address some of those issues? But also, how, how else can we be intimate besides intercourse? Like... This is what, something we talk about with premarital cu- couples all the time. Because again, like we knew nothing going in, but being intimate does not necessarily always mean intercourse. There are other ways to be intimate with one another that you can still pleasure one another. You can still, you know, um, fill some of those voids without the actual act of intercourse. I said that word a lot. Yeah, you did. <laughs> Welcome. There's one word that she won't say because she hates this word more than any other word. You want to say it? Yeah, you can say it. I'm she hates the word penetrate. Come on now. Basketball? She can't even listen to a basketball like, game and she's on, like, oh man, really? I, can't, I can't take it. Can we use can't another take word? It. So. If you need more examples, see her afterwards and she'll feel free to let you know. <laughs> Do you have examples of hills to die on versus something you can agree to disagree on? Um... I think it's hard to give like specific examples of hills to die on because that's going to be different for all of us. I think for me, it's something, is this something that it's just my issue that I need to work through and I can work through it and we need to move on? Or is this something that's going to like gnaw at me and I, it, it's more something I'm sweeping under the rug that when that rug gets pulled up, it's going to like go. Uh, yeah, I think the Bigger issues are obvious. I'm trying to think of like, like premarital couples or couples that are newly married. Um, you know, for an example is uh, we get married and he assumes that I'm his mom now and everything that his mom did for him, I do for him. And he doesn't think about any of the things, I'm picking on the guy, sorry, um, you know, of the things to help out or the things that you do. And I tried to overcome that, but now it's getting to the point where resentment is setting in, right? Where I'm just like, I go into the bathroom and it's destroyed and your expectation is that I'm just gonna fix it all and make it better. And I have, that's, that's, that's a hill worth dying on because if we don't talk about this, guess what, it, exp- it, it explodes, right? I mean, there, there are things that you just know you can't just move on from, that this is important enough that we've gotta, we've gotta address it. Now, there's a lot of little things that you can nitpick and little things that you just have to deal with personally, that's, that's different. I think that's, that's super personal to you and what, what you can let go and not build resentment towards is kind of what a friend You guys are killing these questions. I see, I knew you had it in you. You guys taught that directing your emotional energy elsewhere can destroy sexual intimacy. Would you be able to expound on this? What if you have a job that requires some of your emotional energy? Uh, absolutely. I understand that part. That, but what, I, what I'm saying is... Um, more of what you would know as unhealthy in that um, I have a coworker of the opposite sex at work and um, I start investing in them emotionally and sharing deeper level of things. It's the same thing like pornography does to us. It's like I'm now instead of you know, being exclusively towards my spouse, now I'm looking at other things and so I'm not reserving that for them. I, I tell people all times, if you begin to starve your attention and your eyes towards the things of this world, your spouse becomes more desirable and you desire that more. But if you're giving that to everybody else, like your emotional energy, your emotional connection, um, the things that you should only be sharing with one another, you're sharing with other people or people that aren't your spouse, uh, that does not create intimacy. That, that kills intimacy, right? And when, when marriages go through difficult times, there's gonna be a temptation sometimes to maybe share an emotional connection with somebody else. That's how a lot of affairs start. They don't start off with saying, hey, I'm gonna ruin my life here and everything that I've built over the last 12 years. They think to themselves, oh, um, this seems like a cool person. I'm somewhat kind of drawn to them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a little bit probably more than I should. You know, mm-hmm. that's, that's how it often begins. And I would say, again, boundaries. Whether that be like you're sharing your emotional, what was it, what was the, like the emotional, what was the word? I don't know. Emotional something. 
Energy? Energy, your emotional energy with another person, but maybe it is the job. I'm like, a lot of people don't, sorry. Uh, yeah. I don't know, a lot of people don't know how demanding being a pastor of a church is. And emotionally uh, draining it can be and dealing with lots of stuff all the time. So having a boundary is really, really important, even in your job or even with your kids, even uh, with your other relationships, having those boundaries to know, okay, I got to be able to, to, to stop myself because I could allow myself to give all my energy to this. And it's a good thing. Maybe this job is a wonderful thing, but having the boundary to say, I have to stop here for my marriage sake, for my kids sake, for my whatever, or maybe, you know, for some of you moms, it's putting all your emotional energy into your children. It's so easy to do. And we, we don't even mean to, we don't even know that we're doing it, but you've got to have that self-awareness and that boundary to say, okay, I've only got so much left. I got to set this boundary to, to keep this healthy. Yeah, it's good. What is a good, I got to go over to Christian worldview and finish up kingdom politics. Come on now. What is a good way to navigate times that I am not in the mood, but my spouse is? When do I know if I should push through? Quotation marks. I don't know I what, say they, take what they one meant for the by team. that. But, or if I need to just accept that's where I am for that moment. They really did put that in quotations. That's why. That's so that's good. Why. I love it. Yeah. That's good. Um, our opinion, our take on the matter. Uh, I think there are times where you're just honest with each other and be like, hey, I don't, I don't have it in me right now. I, I've never said that in my entire life, but she said that <laughs> once or twice before. Um, I also think, and uh, again... You have said that before. Don't even. Really? I'm, I wasn't... Maybe I'm, like a handful, but still, you have. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Um, anyway, uh, there are times where she's really honest and... We, we tell couples this all the time. There, if, if your sexual intimacy is one way, if it's like someone's taking one for the team and it's just one, and that's all it is all the time, something's wrong. Like that's just not the way it should be. But there are times that she knows the situation I'm in and in order to serve me, she would be like, this can be a 20 minute thing or it can be like a three minute thing. And I'm, it used to be offend me, but it doesn't offend me anymore. <laughs> and she was like, I'm just not in the mood tonight, so let's not worry about me, this is just for you. And then she'll serve me in that way. And uh, I'm really grateful for a wife that understands that, is willing to know that, understands me or asks. And um, I think that, I think you have to be honest but I also don't think that it always has to be like, you know, the whole enchilada. And I think there what, are, what there are appropriate that? times to say just no. I mean, like, it's okay to no is an, accept, an acceptable answer as well. Um, but I think you how, have... How you turn them down matters, right? Because if, sure. if you want someone to be honest with you, you can't be like, stop asking no. You know, I mean, that kind of thing, or they won't ever want to talk about it again, but yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's okay to share honestly where you're at. And if that's just no, it may just be a no, but there are times that I always say, I'm like, I think it's totally appropriate to take one for the team. But if you're taking one for the team all the time, something's wrong. There's, there's been a breakdown and you got to pick that ball back up. It's a mutual, um, enjoyment. It should be. Yeah. Push through. Yeah. Um, <laughs> last one. <laughs> Uh, intentional community. How do you balance choosing friends wisely to create the intentional community that was discussed in week three while also trying to be friends with non-believers and share God's love, be an example? Awesome question. Um, I think you need all of those relationships in your life. Uh, with non-believers or people who are not leading you closer to Jesus, you have to have a boundary. You're not giving them full access to everything that you are. You're not sharing your deepest um, you wouldn't go to them for advice on your marriage or things like that. that. That's what we're talking about. Boundaries aren't a bad thing. A boundary doesn't mean they're a bad person. It just means like if I have a non-believer in my life, like I'm investing them, I'm, I may invite them over to my house, we're building that relationship, but there's still some level of boundary that exists there, right? Because if not, that, that, it, it doesn't work. And so I, I, the deepest level of relationship has to be people that are leading me closer to Jesus. And I think that can be judged by time too. How much time am I spending with these people who are intentionally growing me closer to my spouse and to Jesus versus how much time am I spending with people who are drawing me away from them? Yeah. Um, I, I really do. I got to go finish this other class. You guys are going to talk about marriage expectations to end this time together. I want you to know that we consider it an honor 
Like, thank you for being here for this four weeks. Um, if there's ever, ever, ever anything that we can do for you, if you're in a tough time, if you're in crisis right now, um, come find us, please. Let us help you. And if we can't help you, we know people who can. And if it's not today, if it's five years from now, if you stop attending City Church, but you don't know where to turn, you can turn to us, okay? We really mean that. We, we want you to have healthy marriages. We want to invest in you. We know that this was just four weeks, but it hopefully it imparted something uh, of life into you. And uh, we truly do consider that an honor. Um, so as I walk back here to this other class, why don't you pray for them? And you guys can finish off with marriage expectations conversation. Sound good? Lord, we thank you, God, for um, your goodness to us, your favor in our lives. Lord, we thank you for the example of marriage that you give us in your word and that it is not something to be entered in lightly. And uh, you've given us such a beautiful example, uh, but also just the covenant that we're in. And so, Lord, as we um, strive to... uh, just be in that covenant and to be committed to the covenant that we've made with, with our spouses. Lord, I pray that you would honor that. I pray that you would give each and every couple wisdom and guidance and direction by the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray that when we don't know, we would invite the Holy Spirit into our marriage to help lead us and guide us into truth and into wisdom and into action. God, I pray that you would provide the right people at the right time in each and every one of these individuals' lives, both the individual and the couple. Lord, I pray that you would put the right people at the right time to be intentional in their lives and to help them grow closer to you and to help them grow closer to one another. We love you, God, and we thank you that you have given us such a good example And I pray, just as Matt was saying, these four weeks, it's only four weeks. And there's so much that um, more that we would probably even want to say and pour into each and every person. But Lord, I pray that this is a start and that the ball that maybe has been dropped would be picked up or the conversation that's needed to be had for so long will just start. We're maybe not going to get to the finish line today or this week or even this year, but Lord, I pray that we're just moving forward in our relationship with you and our relationship with our spouse. God, we love you and we thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us in Jesus' name, amen. You guys can look over these uh, questions to discuss with your group.